okay? Thank you. I should be drinking coffee and not herb tea so I can stay awake. It's Tuesday, so it must be Portland. Uh, anyway, it's about my sixth visit. Once I went out to the Oakland airport, said I'm ready to go to Portland, and they said, you can't, there's an ice storm up there. And Reverend Toll had arranged for me to speak here and at his Presbyterian church in, or Episcopal church in Milwaukee and so on. And uh, I went back to Berkeley for the night. The next time I was to come up here, I got a plane from Boston to San Francisco. It arrived at noon. I had three hours to wait to, uh, for the flight to Portland. That looked pretty easy. Sitting there, and they announced to United Airlines that the flight was late coming from San Jose. And at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, at 7 o'clock, I was supposed to be speaking right here. The woman next to me said, why are you going up to Portland? And I said, well, I'm speaking at a Presbyterian church right now. <laughs> so 10 o'clock came, and United flew us to Las Vegas. My baggage had gone on to Portland. They put us up overnight in some dowdy old hotel that's seen its better days full of slot machines on the ground floor, and you could hardly get through the slot machines to the registration desk. And then the next morning, some other airline flew us to Portland, and I uh, missed uh, the talk here and the talk the next morning in Milwaukee, uh, but did make the Oregonian with about five other good folks, um, including Reverend uh, Dick Toll. I'm particularly appreciative of the work Jennifer has done on, on very short notice, remarkable, and the people she's working with here, and her long-suffering spouse, John, uh, Reverend Mo Moiso, Dick Toll, who put me in touch with Jennifer. She hasn't forgiven him yet. He's... <coughs> He's over in Jerusalem now, uh, and Elaine Kelly, who works with uh, Friends of Sabeel, um, and the Nelsons and others who've been very helpful, uh, the Hansons and so forth, uh, taking me, uh, rushing me around town. And I never get to see the Rose Garden when I'm in Portland, so I really need to come for a day extra of Powell's books. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'm an American Jewish human rights activist, and... Uh, um, at some point, I'll ask uh, Diane, who's been kind enough to pass the material around, and I didn't bring many copies of this, but this is to prove to you that I do exist. It's a story in the, in the Boston Globe recently. Uh, I want to touch on, on, on five things. The question of, of values, approaching this issue, something about the history, the current situation, including terrorism and human rights, the um, U.S. policy in the area, and then what's to be done which is the, the key question. These are all sort of lectures in and of themselves, and I'll try to do this in 20 or 25 minutes without losing you and without stumbling over my words, because really one needs to have as much time or more for discussion than for, uh, for one more person speechifying. Uh, my wife refuses to go to hear anybody talk for more than 15 minutes, and I think she's smart. <laughs> the, um, you know, unless it's a Dan Berrigan or somebody who keeps you awake and, and on your feet. Um, and Dennis Kucinich, whom I heard, who's not only very good on this issue, but a lot of issues, is a very dynamic speaker and, and someone who has a very holistic approach, speaking of politicians uh, who won't get to the White House. <laughs> so uh, uh, Search for Justice and Equality in Palestine Israel is a human rights peace group that believes and states on our letterhead that justice for Palestinian Arabs and security for Israeli Jews are interdependent and not mutually exclusive. In other words, the two peoples will swim together or sink together, hang together or hang separately, as Ben Franklin put it, or more eloquently, as Martin Luther King Jr. put it, we have to learn to get, live together as brothers and sisters or we'll perish together as fools. And it seems to me that if you believe in God as a Jew or Christian or Muslim or what have you, or you're thinking about whether you believe in God like Unitarians, you know, all, all people are supposed to be equal in God's eyes, and under, under the law and legal systems, they're supposed to be treated equally. So Jews and Palestinians, Israeli Jews and Palestinian Arabs, should be uh, treated equally uh, under the law and uh, seen as equal human beings. The... Um, so it shouldn't be seen as a zero-sum game, not that there's going to be a winner or a loser. They're both going to lose or they're both going to win. And that seems to be an approach that we need to take, and everybody needs to be in, encouraged to take that approach. Um, the, I think we need to say to supporters of Israel and Israeli policy in the Jewish community and, and the uh, Christian coalition, the fundamentalist community and so forth, politicians, that we need to support Palestinian rights for two reasons. First, that they're an end in and of themselves. They're just as important, their rights, uh, as the rights of Israeli Jews. No more so, nor no less so. Okay? 
because if you think Israeli Jews are more important than Palestinians, you're you know, an anti-Palestinian or Israeli chauvinist. If you think Palestinians are more important than Jews, you're a Palestinian chauvinist or an anti-Semite or what have you. Second thing is that if we believe that this is not a zero-sum zero game, that they're both going to win or lose uh, together, that the, the rights of Palestinians are a means to the end of security and the rights of Israeli Jews. So even if you don't care about Palestinians, you should be concerned about their rights because that's the way, that's the means to the end of securing rights for Israeli Jews, whether it's in one state or two states or two and a half states or what have you. Um, uh, my wife says, don't tell more than one Jewish joke, uh, uh, and I'll just tell one. But there's a story of uh, Rabbi Cohen and, and, and his good friend, Father Murphy. So they were good friends. Rabbi Cohen's on his deathbed. Uh, Father Murphy rushes in and says, um, Josh, this is terrible. And Josh Cohen says, you know, Father Murphy, Sean, <laughs> please convert me to Catholicism. And the priest says, I don't want to do that. That's crazy. You've been such a good, devout Jew all your life. I insist. He converts him to Catholicism. The priest exits. Um, the David uh, Cohen rushes in. The son says, Dad, you've been a good Jew all your life. You know, what are you doing? Converting to Catholicism on your death, deathbed. So the father says to his son, he says, look, if I have to go, it's better it's one of them than one of us. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this is the problem among Christians, Jews, and Muslims, among Palestinians, uh, Israelis, and Americans, is it's, you know, one of us is more important than, than five of them. And this ethnocentrism and exclusivism rather than inclusivism among, among the Abrahamic religions, the chauvinism among nationalisms, this we have to you know, struggle to, to overcome sometimes within ourselves, but certainly uh, within the policies of, of the respective governments uh, that are involved. And George Orwell said that the nationalist not only does not um, disapprove of the crimes of his own state, but has remarkable capacity for not even hearing of them. And this, I think, is, is a serious problem. So uh, there's, a, there's quite a different story about a rabbi with a student where the student says to the rabbi, Rabbi, when do we know when the, when the, uh, the darkness, the night ends and the, and, and, and the dawn breaks? Is it when we can tell the difference between a, a wolf and a dog? No. And nor says the rabbi when we can tell the difference between a pear tree and an apple tree. And the rabbi says we can tell when we can look at the person in front of us at that person's face and see neither black nor white, but that that person is a brother or a sister. And until that time, we will continue to walk in the darkness. So unless you have this mindset, I think, it's hard to deal with the issue. Now, the issue historically, most Americans come in in the, in the, in the middle of the story, and they have to go back and realize that at the turn of the century, Palestinian Muslims and Christians were about 95% of the population. And they were promised by the British and the French and, and you know, Woodrow Wilson uh, through his 14 points that they would, they would have self-determination. They helped throw the, the Turks out. And suddenly they found themselves saddled uh, through the League of Nations with British and French mandates uh, in the Middle East. And the British mandate, which incorporated the, the Balfour Declaration, um, the, the League of Nations gave the British a mandate over Palestine. The... Um, the, the uh, Balfour Declaration consisted of the British government telling the World Zionist Organization that Her Majesty's government looks with, with, um, you know, with pleasure or, or supports the idea of a homeland for the Jewish people in Palestine, Jewish national home, provided it didn't infringe on the civil and religious rights of Palestinians. Well, Woodrow Wilson sent a commission to look into the matter called the King Crane Commission, and they discovered one, one, of, the, one, of, them, one of them was in the oil business, the other was the president of Oberlin uh, College, and they discovered that overwhelmingly uh, Palestinian uh, Muslims and Christians, the 95% of the population, wanted their independence, uh, that they weren't willing to uh, accept being turned into a, a, a subject people, a minority in their own society, and that the Zionists planned to, to use force if necessary, British force if possible, their own force down the road, to impose a Jewish state uh, on the indigenous population. So during the 20s, very few Jews in the world went to Palestine, and the Zionism didn't, the idea that, that the homeland of Jews was in, in Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, didn't grab Jews, but during the 30s, because of the rise of the Third Reich, more Jews went, and so what you had at the end of uh, World War II were survivors of the Holocaust and people who had gone earlier in the, in the 30s, you had the Jewish population becoming a third 
Um, now, now, I forgot. I, I don't tell my wife, but I will tell a second joke, but we'll just call it a story. You've all heard, you've all heard that the sun never set on the British Empire, right? You've heard this. Those of you old enough like me, uh, beards are sufficiently gray, the, the, um, or white. The, does anyone know why the sun never set on the British Empire? Ah, you got it. God didn't trust the British in the dark. <laughs> now, now I think we have an American empire and God's probably not trusting us in the dark. But anyway. So then we had the partition plan in 1947 where the Jewish state was to have about 55% of, uh, of, of the land mass between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea and the Palestinian uh, state to be, the twin state, was to have uh, 45%, even though the Palestinians were still two-thirds of the population. Uh, war broke out in 48 and uh, many Palestinian refugees, uh, or Palestinians fled and became the Palestinian refugees. Many fled as people flee a, a theater, war theater. Uh, many were forced out. And then there were subsequent wars. And in 67, the Israelis took over the Gaza Strip, which Egypt had taken over. There was, there was no Palestinian state that came out of the fighting in 1948. It was aborted. And what was to be the Palestinian state was taken over by Egypt, Jordan, and Israel. And under the partition plan, Jerusalem was to be partition uh, was to be uh, excuse me a a a single open um, city, and it was partitioned by Jordan and Israel. And the uh, Jordanians took what became known as the West Bank, and the Egyptians took what was known as Gaza. And in 1967, the Israelis threw out the Egyptians and the Jordanians and took over East Jerusalem, which from Jordan, the West Bank, they took over the Gaza Strip from, from, uh, the, um, from the Egyptians, and these became known as the Occupied Territories after 67. And what followed was the Israelis, rather than trying to trade off these Occupied Territories for peace, began to settle these areas with settlements, uh, the Jewish settlements, which are illegal under international law. It's not just that it's illegal to take your populace and put it in occupied territories. The process involved confiscating land and diverting water resources from the indigenous Palestinians. So at this point, you had three groups of Palestinians, and you have three groups today. You have the Palestinians, often forgotten, who are citizens of Israel, in Israel, uh, in a Jewish state, and they are, they are second-class citizens. You have... Um, Palestinians in the occupied territories who were denied all sorts of basic rights and, and the right to move, movement, the right to access to jobs, education, medical facilities. Uh, thousands of their homes have been destroyed. Uh, we mentioned land confiscation and so forth. The ma major Israeli human rights group is called B'Tselem. It may be on this excellent flyer back there that lists websites, but it's B-T-S-E-L-E-M. Dot org, And they have done a lot of studies about uh, violations of human rights in the occupied territories. And one of them, issued in 1998 on the 50th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, notes that Israel is violating 29 of the 30 articles of the, uni of the uh, Universal Declaration of Rights, everything but the article prohibiting slavery, in its treatment of Palestinians living under occupation. So that's pretty powerful statement of how bad the occupation is. A Jordanian a farmer told an Israeli journalist back in the 70s, he said, look, we lived under the Ottoman Turks, then we lived under the, under the British, then we lived under the Jordanians, now we're living under the Israelis. Four occupations. They all taxed us, taxed us without representation. But the Israelis are the first ones to bring in settlers and take our land. In other words, sort of static occupation, if you will, um, not necessarily benign, but, but certainly not um, colonialistic in the, in the sense of taking people's land away from them. Um, they could survive the first three, but they're having a very hard time and may not survive this fourth. And, and this is the virulence of the Israeli occupation. Uh, what's happening to Palestinians in many ways is parallels to what happened to Native Americans. And Native Americans are still suffering here and there and everywhere in this country um, from various types of discrimination. So uh, the, 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 uh, that's the situation. Then you have the question of terrorism. And the Palestinian violence, 
suicide bombing and so on needs to be deplored by supporters of the Palestinians, uh, by everyone else, because A, it's horrific, uh, and B, it, it is um, you know, only hurting the Palestinians because it's giving Ariel Sharon excuses for, for uh, even further uh, oppressive measures. And the Israeli violence is state terrorism, but nobody will call it that. Uh, the media often calls it retaliation. What you have, though, is not uh, Palestinian violence and Israeli retaliation. You have a cycle of violence. And both sides are using the wrong means, and the Israelis are trying to use violence to, to uh, further uh, occupy and, and, and entrench their occupation, which has to end in order to get the violence to end. Um, the, the U.S. government's role has been really pernicious. While we talk about the peace process and we're trying to bring peace, since 1948, the, Israel, the U.S. government has given Israel, like, <laughs> given a friend who's drunk too much the keys to the car. You don't do that. That's <laughs> not friendship. Um, we've allowed the Israelis to lurch from war to war, and they've suffered along with the Palestinians, so that at any point, U.S. pressure in Israel. There were peace offers from various Arab governments starting right after the 48 war. And most Americans don't know anything about these peace offers. So if the Israelis have been willing to compromise on the refugee problem, on the territorial compromise, uh, even one, but certainly on both of these levels, they could probably have had peace with the Egyptians, the Syrians, you know, not with Gaddafi or someone, but that really didn't matter, with their, base, with their, with their immediate neighbors that they uh, fought wars with. So the U.S. has undercut by vetoing resolutions, dozens of resolutions in the U.N., and um, opposing resolutions in, uh, in the, in the uh, General Assembly, vetoing Security Council resolutions, and voting often with Israel and maybe, uh, um, you know, the Micronesia or some, some island that I'd never heard of. The last, one of the last votes, there were 100 plus votes critical of Israel's policies and there were four against Israel and the U.S. and the other two places I had to go to the Atlas. And I found there were two islands in the Pacific that have a population, you know, combined of like 30,000 people and they each have a vote. So they voted along with Israel and the U.S. So that, that's... The, the amount of support Israel has, and those are, that's where the U.S. is at. So uh, U.S. policy really has, has uh, been part of the problem, not part of the solution. And by peace process, I think the U.S. means managing the conflict so it doesn't get totally out of hand, but there's no real interest in a settlement, a peace settlement. So, so much for, for U.S. policy, and we're giving Israel three, four billion dollars a year. Some people would argue it's more, but at least that amount. And that is underwriting the Israeli occupation. This is A, in violation of U.S. law, which states that, that uh, we should not be giving foreign military, we shouldn't be giving military and economic aid to any government which practices a consistent pattern of gross violations of human rights. Congress passed this legislation back in the mid-70s. So we're violating with our money to Israel, for that matter, our money to Egypt and Turkey and the Philippines and so on. But Israel's is the highest recipient and is occupying uh, the land of another people. So there's no excuse for that type of aid. And in 1998, Search for Justice and Equality in Palestine, Israel, got, uh, I know there's at least one gentleman in, in the, the room, and uh, maybe somebody, yeah, someone else down the hall. Uh, we got 1,100, I think uh, the Reverend here, Jim Moiso, 1,100 religious leaders, mostly clergy, signed a petition that we circulated calling for a total cutoff of aid to, um, to Israel and the Palestinian Authority until they cease violating human rights. Both the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which both Israel and the PA were violating, but also the um, Geneva Convention for the Treatment of, of People in Occupied Territories, which says you don't put your civilian people in occupied territory, and so forth. And you don't take their water away from them, and you don't deprive them of access to medical care, and so on. This included, uh, I can't cite Presbyterian bishops because the Presbyterians are too democratic to have them, but we got 22 ELCA bishops, about 60 Methodist, 60 Episcopal bishops, and several uh, Catholic bishops among those, and we got national coverage. And this here, some of the coverage in the Christian century and so forth, if, um, if Diana is still around here, um, is, who offered kindly to, to get 
these passed around. And the other two things, one are some letters we've had in the International Herald Tribune, the Christian Science Monitor, and the Chicago Tribune. And the final item, Diane, thank you, is, um, you see our letterhead, people are on it, Pete Seeger and Noam Chomsky. <laughs> Bishop Gumbleton, who is the most progressive and thoughtful bishop in the Roman Catholic Church, and Casey Kasem, who many of you know, in the Arab American community, and so forth. So, so the question comes down is, what can we do about it? What can you do about it here and, and elsewhere? Because if those of us who go around speaking, which is the easy thing to do, if the hard thing is to do what Jennifer did, and with help from others, to set up the talks. Because I'm speaking from someone who's done both. And I know it's much harder to have someone to come to Boston and fill up two or three of their days, you know, than to be the speaker to come into Portland and go around and, and yak at people and with people. So, you, you, unless the Oregonian and the congressional delegation here begin to hear from you folks, nothing will change. So I'd rather speak to nine people and know that the day after, three of them are going to do something and speak to 50, and they, they say, that's great, and they go home and do nothing. Um, so you can work in terms of contributing time and or funds, hopefully both, to local groups, several of which are here and sponsoring this talk, and time and or funds to work with us. The, the time would mostly be with the media, and the funds are very much needed because I didn't come out here in Air Force One or Air Force Two, and my wife always says, well, you go out to the West Coast and people say, that's great what you have to say, but then they don't support the work. And um, because I'm able to work full time, I've gone to 50 major newspapers in this country, one, two, eight times, four or five times met with Oregonian editors. Uh, and you have to be able to get on a plane and go and do it. And you have to know whom you're going to talk to and you have to know what to say. Just like you couldn't run this church without professional people working full-time, several of them on staff. And the other thing with newspapers is I've written opinion articles for the Oregonian, two or three, maybe four, and also for some 30 major papers around the country. And helping to work with local people around the country so that they're empowered to be more effective with their media. So I've come to places like Portland and often gone in with local people who had never been into the Oregonian. And then I leave, but those local people can continue those contacts that they've made, the networking. So our work is very important, and the work of groups like Churches for Middle East Peace, which is a national effort uh, of 14 um, groups, like the Presbyterian Church USA and like the ELCA. They have an office in Washington. There's a group called the U.S. Campaign to End the Occupation. There's a Jewish group called um, um, Jewish Voice for Peace. This is their button. I think it says, I just got it yesterday, two days ago. Uh, two peoples, one future. They don't say one state or two states. That's open, but one future. They would like to go national. Uh, so all of these groups need financial support and, and volunteer time. Because on any issue, under the sun, like the gun issue, People on both sides of the issue realize you need lobbyists, you need research, you need publicists, you need public speakers, you need people to uh, work with the media, and you can't do that just with volunteers. You need the volunteers and you need the professional staff. Um, so it helps to have a sort of a organizational memory. And if you have people working, you know, day in and day out, they make the contacts and can continue to develop those contacts. Uh, whether it's with Congress or the media or non-governmental organizations. So there are always the people that have put their finger on it. Um, uh, before I get to those people, uh, let me say something about John F. Kennedy coming from Massachusetts. I don't want to ignore uh, our former president, and maybe John F. Kerry will be another JFK as president. But Kennedy said, those who make peaceful evolution impossible make violent revolution inevitable. Those who make peaceful evolution impossible make violent revolution inevitable. The United States, our government, has blocked efforts by Palestinians to achieve their rights peacefully through the UN, through the international community, and really pushed them to the point, some of them, where violent revolution is, is, is what they turn to. 
And this would have been what was happening in South Africa, where even Nelson Mandela and the African National Congress was beginning to turn to violent acts um, because they had despaired of, of nonviolence achieving their rights. They were getting no support from the international community. And the U.S. has never pressed the Israelis to, you know, to recognize Palestinian rights and to work out an equitable agreement. Uh, certainly blacks in the South, if they hadn't gotten the support of the federal government, the judiciary, the executive and legislative branches, there would have been more and more calls for violence because nonviolence is, is not achieving anything. So our, our government is, is really um, the worst enemy of the Israelis and certainly the worst, worst enemy of the Palestinians, creating hostility in the Middle East that feeds terrorism and wasting taxpayers' money, or worse, taking taxpayers' money and helping the Israelis oppress Palestinians and lead to the condition where Israelis are blown up on buses. So our government is harming the American people, the Israeli people, and the Palestinian people, and, and others beyond that. So that's the problem, is changing our government, because that's the cause of and what's happening out there are, are the symptoms. The root cause is U.S. policy. And until you begin to descend on your members of Congress and your media and your churches and get the churches to do more than just pass a resolution and encourage Jews to, to speak out, you know, who are doves but still in the closet. <laughs> uh, I have to, and, and realize that it's hard for Jews to speak out because there are a lot of pressures on them, internal pressures, conflicts, and also external pressures. But there are hundreds of rabbis in this country that support Rabbis for Human Rights, which is a group in Israel that's going out and trying to block bulldozers and so on. And the other, the other quotes I want to leave you with, Pope Paul VI said, if you want to work for peace, work for justice. And you've probably seen that bumper sticker. That's a great bumper sticker. And Edmund Burke, uh, in pre-feminist days, and so I won't clean up his language, said, all that's necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. <laughs> Some feminists would say there are no good men. But uh, <laughs> leaving that aside, I won't get into that argument. Um, I think we have to um, realize that, that the talk that I give, the discussion we have, is the appetizer. The main course is what do you do tomorrow? Because if, if it washes over you and not much changes, I may have changed some attitudes. But if it doesn't translate from attitudes into public action in the public domain, then all I'm doing is creating a larger silent majority or maybe a silent significant minority. Um, there are some very active people here in Portland. I, I'm very impressed. A lot of them, you know, when I would come here five or eight years ago, there wasn't that level of activity. And I think there ahead of the people in Seattle, even though it's a bigger community, and I'll be there tomorrow. But, uh, and I'll tell them, you know, you ought to measure up to Portland and, 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 and get going. And you ought to bring people up from Portland to train you and all that. Um, unless, unless there's, um, unless the, the people who are committed here, that number is double, triple, quadruple, nothing, uh, you know, you need a critical mass. You need to, a quantum leap in the number of people involved. And there are many things you can do without ever leaving your house. You know, one more body at a demonstration is probably less important than you're picking up the phone and calling the Oregonian and thanking them for something they need positive uh, input and feedback or being constructively critical. If you don't want to talk to anyone, call them at 8 p.m. when they're not in their office and leave you know, a, a thoughtful message. Not too long, but you know, tell them what, what's on your mind. So anyway, I appreciate this. I've gone over my 25 minutes and would welcome welcome your, your questions and comments. You've been listening to Ned Hanauer, founder and director of Search for Justice and Equality in Palestine, Israel. In a moment, we'll return to the question and answer session from the presentation. Search, which has been active since its founding in 1972, seeks to improve American media coverage of the Arab-Israeli conflict by disseminating information about the issue and by urging journalists to cover the conflict accurately and to support a just peace in editorials. To find out more about Search and its work, please visit their website at www.searchforjustice.org. And now we return to the question and answer session from the presentation. Ned Hanauer spoke in Portland, Oregon on April 13, 2004. 
The first question was about a report in the Israeli English daily newspaper Haaretz, which forecast what will happen when Israeli Prime Minister Ariel Sharon comes to Washington. The forecast is that President Bush is going to come down hard in support of what Sharon is doing, in support of the withdrawal from Gaza, and a vision of a final settlement that does not move the main settlement blocks in the West Bank. How can we use this kind of event, the visit by Ariel Sharon, to pull people together, to focus our work into some kind of action, rather than to become dispirited by this visit? Yeah, well, it could be some demonstration outside uh, some federal office tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, there'll be a report in the Oregonian. Maybe people can respond to that. Um, um, you, know, you, you, you might try to see whether the public radio station here, KOPB or whatever, will do something. And um, I talked to uh, how many of you belong to churches where the congregation might have a speaker that hasn't so far had one or a program. You know, um, you know there are also all sorts of groups. Uh, university, what is it, the American Association of University Women, the World Affairs Council, the United Nations Association, and all sorts of groups, Rotary Clubs, because you've got a good many qualified, capable people that can speak, but you, somebody has to open doors for them, get them speaking engagements, and then try to get the people that come committed to do something, or at least to say, yes, I'd be glad to work in my congressional district. How many of you would be willing to contact your member of Congress? Okay? Uh, it's going to be more effective than if I call uh, Representative Fazio or Senator um, uh, Wyden or whatever. So there are a lot of hands went up. Um, does anybody who doesn't think they can, or what reason would anyone not talk to their representative? One member of the audience commented that even non-citizens can always write letters and simply not mention that they're not Americans. Yeah, right, right, exactly, exactly. They're not going to ask. And after all, if people want to make Schwarzenegger able to become president, who was born abroad, uh, yeah. The next member of the audience said that he had had a conversation with a recent American ambassador to Jordan, and that the former ambassador's comment was that the biggest obstacle to changing American political opinion is not in fact the American Jewish community, but rather the evangelical Christian right. Do you have any insight into how we might be more effective in challenging and confronting these influences on U.S. public opinion about the conflict in Israel-Palestine? <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a Methodist a theologian who once said, look, Ned, you can't deal with these people. They're wired in a certain way, hardwired, and, and uh, you, can't, you can't get through to them. Uh, but certainly the Israel lobby is made up of, of uh, you know, a lot of Jewish organizations that aren't necessarily speaking for uh, a monolithic constituency. And people like Jerry Falwell and Pat Robinson in the Christian Coalition, and maybe some people in the military-industrial complex that like to sell Israel all sorts of weapons that, uh, you know, to keep, keep that going. Because when we give Israel all these billions of dollars, they turn around and buy all sorts of American weapons. It's sort of like a subsidy from our pockets to Boeing or somebody. And, uh, but it's very hard. You have to have people in the evangelical, we're talking about the, ev the fundamentalists, not all evangelicals, as, as you know. Um, you probably have to find some people in that community who understand the issue and then get them talking to other people because I don't speak, and I'm not sure whether you speak their language, that one can, can relate to them. But, you know, so you have to write off certain places in the Bible Belt, maybe. <laughs> and, but a place like Oregon, uh, which doesn't, you know, have a huge fundamentalist community or a huge Jewish community, it ought to be a place where you can turn around a lot of the members of Congress uh, with, with a lot of diligent uh, organizing. Yeah. The next member of the audience commented on an editorial in the New York Times about the Gaza withdrawal an editorial that was, this audience member said, for the most part, pretty good, except that it used the same language as seen in the Oregonian, emphasizing that there was no effective Palestinian leadership, and one wonders why they would think that Ariel Sharon, the butcher of Beirut, ought to be thought of as effective leadership. 
Yeah. Um, my right. other question. <laughs> there you go. Everybody should go back and email the Times tonight. You know, 100 words or less to N, um, you know, uh, letters at uh, nytimes.com uh, and say, you know, that uh, if, if they're going to talk about um, whatever Arafat, um, um, then they ought to talk about Sharon. You know. But go ahead. Sorry. The other question raised by this member of the audience was about the candidates for president in the 2004 election. Local organizers have been brainstorming on how people engaged in these issues might influence John Kerry because they feel that they have no chance of influencing George Bush. One thought was to try to organize in different cities to publish open letters directed to the candidates and addressing these issues. For example, an open letter published in our daily newspaper. Well, I, w I would try to descend on whomever the Democratic uh, <coughs> delegates are from, from the state to the convention back in my city of Boston in, in July uh, and, and try to talk with them, meet with them before they go, and when they come back, I would try to press the Kerry campaign here <coughs> nationally by email, phone, tie up their phone line. You know, emails can be deleted or dismissed or something. <coughs> you talk to someone on the phone, you, you sort of have to press them and you can maybe get a response. You have to force them to at least deal with the issue in a way that they don't have to with an email, where you never hear from them, or you get a, a form letter. Uh, and I would, um, you know, uh, get letters to the editor. That, that's, that used to cost 33 cents or whatever stamp used to be, uh, or still is, but was, uh, but email you can send for free. So if you're going to put $10,000 as an ad, I would put the 10000 in and take on an intern or a student or a young person working part of full time that will be organizing all sorts of people in each congressional district. Don't throw it at the Oregonian, uh, you know, in an ad. That's really ephemeral. It doesn't build a structure. It doesn't build anything that's, that's enduring. It doesn't do organizing. This is how groups that get anything done. They organize, and you've got to have organizers to organize. You can't get around that. If, unless you're willing to put in the money and the time that other groups and other causes do on both sides of the gun issue, both sides of the abortion issue, environmentalists and anti-environmentalists and so forth, each side has lobbyists, publicists, people that work with the media, uh, research people. I was just in Berkeley and my brother, who was one of the founders of the uh, non-smokers rights movement in this country and became the president of the Americans uh, uh, for non-smokers rights, ANR, took me to their office and they took on the tobacco lobby 20 years ago when you, people said you can't take on the tobacco lobby and they've done a fantastic job. They've got 15 people in Berkeley working full time with all sorts of databases and so on. You can't do that without funds. And we ought to have my wife, you know, I want to go back and say we got 15 to 20 people, uh, not just to put money, which would be nice, in the hat as it's passed tonight, but who will say, yeah, we'll support your work year in and year out, because whether you come to Portland or not, you're going places, and, and, and one city is as important as the other. But there ought to be the, the funding locally, so that the local groups that are sponsoring this tonight can have someone working part-time. Or, when I go up to Seattle, I'll say, look, Get Seattle together with people in, in Portland and, and, and uh, Olympia and Salem and Eugene and have a Northwest office for justice in the Middle East, put it in Seattle or Portland, and between the two states, you ought to find $50,000 and have two people working full-time, one, one in each city. The money is there, Pe but you have to ask people and you have to tell them what it's for. And you have to say, if we have people working around the clock, they're going to do lots of things that we don't have time to do. There are, you know, people in this room who would be glad to go out and speak, but someone has to open the doors for them and get the speaking engagements. And that can be a 22-year-old student or 25-year-old right out of college. Or a 65-year-old. Or a 65-year-old, <laughs> sure, or even a 70-year-old. Right. Um, as I get older, you know, an 80-year-old, why not? Uh, yeah. The next member of the audience commented on some recent coverage by CNN, the cable news network, which ran an interview with Stephen Cohen of the Institute for Middle East Peace and Development. Mr. Cohen said that Ariel Sharon, during his upcoming visit to the United States, may try to lock in an agreement, something that will prevent the president, regardless of who is elected in November, from pursuing any peace process 
that the U.S. would recognize the Israeli withdrawal from Gaza as legitimate and would essentially leave the ongoing illegal occupation of the West Bank untouched. Oh yeah, Sharon wants Bush, but, but you know, Bush can make promises and go back on them. In fact, every presidential candidate, and this year it'll be Bush and Kerry, they say, well, when we become president, we're going to move our embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. It's still in Tel Aviv. Because as soon as you become president, you know what the old story I saw about, about a platform, it's something to run on, not to stand on. And as soon as you get elected, you jump off of it. And then suddenly they discover, no, we can't move the, the embassy to, to Jerusalem. So uh, Bush can sort of fudge it and say, yes, the future border of the Palestinian state won't be right on the green line. And Sharon can go back and say, hey, look what Bush gave me. And Bush can think to himself, I gave nothing, because if they keep some land in the West Bank, uh, they can always give and maybe should give some land in Israel as a, you know, quid pro quo, uh, a land swap, which is what the Geneva uh, Accord that was sort of worked out between some moderates, um, you know, proposes. So I wouldn't worry about that because, A, if Kerry comes in, he can say he's not bound by what Bush said, and if Bush gets reelected, he won't be bound by what he said. And he may not remember what he said, so we don't have a problem with that. Uh, and maybe Sharon will be out and Bush can say, well, you know, that was agreement with Sharon and now there's somebody else there. Uh, but in the end, unless we, unless we, you know, whatever Bush does, we can't control tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. But we have to work to be organized to the point where five days after tomorrow, five months after tomorrow, we can begin to have a bigger impact. And that's why I've, I think it would be great if you began to have, say, truth squads. Every time a member of Congress comes back here to speak, you have people passing out flyers and sitting in the audience to ask questions. Uh, about, well, why are you giving Israel this blank check of billions of dollars when the state of Oregon has, I think, the highest poverty rate in the country. I was shocked to hear that. And, uh, you know, problems with schools and health care and so on. And the money is just giving Israel a blank check to, to uh, terrorize Palestinians and, uh, and bring on more t Palestinian violence and terrorism. So uh, are you representing uh, the state of Israel or the American or the people of Oregon? And if you begin to press members of Congress, after a while they may feel embarrassed because you're then exposing this, this stupidity in front of audiences time and time again. And I'm remembered of Senator Packwood, who when he would come back to the state was met with signs about how he was a, a groper and a womanizer. And I think at one point, finally, he was afraid to come back to his own state. And then he, what, retired or something. So you really have to realize that most members of Congress, you can't convince them on the basis of, of fact or, 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 or justice. You can only convince them that they can take a stand, if they do believe it's the right thing to do, and get away with it because you have organized enough. So people went to see uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt once, and they pleaded their case, and then they were silent, and he said to them, you've convinced me. Now go out and pressure me. Because you may have convinced me that two and two makes four, but until I can get away with saying it is, I'll say it makes five as soon as I leave the privacy of this office here. So even the best intentioned member of Congress, you, you really have to dialogue with them to let them know two and two makes four. But if they get that far, then you have to make it possible for them to, to act on that. And if they refuse to say it makes four, then you really need to use more, more stick than carrot, I think, because then you've got to sort of embarrass them into taking uh, you know, a better, better position. I think journalists are a different group. You really, I mean, a lot of journalists are really trying to, <laughs> to be good journalists, to see what's going on, and you really need to dialogue with them and, and, and keep working with them. Uh, but members of Congress, their bottom line is, can I get reelected? And that's Kerry's bottom line. He wanted to become president, and back in Massachusetts, where he had a pretty dovish cons constituency, he actually voted to give Bush this green light in October of 2002, which shocked a lot of people. He didn't feel any pressure from the left, and uh, he just thought he could do that, and then he'd be all set to, to run for the White House. Um, so you never know. My wife always says, you don't know what's in their heads. Who knows? Who cares? She says, you just have to judge them by how they vote. You know, why psychoanalyze and guess what, what's in Kerry's head, or what's in Bush's head, if anything? I have no idea why Bush does what he does, but we know he has a track record. He calls Ariel Sharon, who is a bona fide war criminal, and has been a war criminal since 53, you know, three decades before Hamas was, was founded, uh, and uh, a decade before the PLO started. 
And uh, Bush calls him a man of peace and has had him to the White House more often than I think any other foreign leader. So that says it all, um, I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then... The next member of the audience described a question in a press conference with President Bush. He was asked about how unhappy the Iraqis were under the U.S. occupation. And the president replied that it was understandable that they were not happy with occupation. This member of the audience wondered why the president couldn't see that the situation was the same for Palestinians living under Israeli occupation. It's shocking he said that about the Iraqis, because they're not under occupation, they're liberated. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, so I think he needed... See, his that. problem was Cheney wasn't there to... to, <laughs> to be, yeah, exactly, yeah. Said, well, it's under, it's under, dangerous under, to let him loose. The question from this member of the audience was about whether the speaker had been able to do any better in getting his message out through radio talk show programs, such as Talk of the Nation on public radio. These programs have experts on to talk about the issues, but it seems that the producers and hosts of these programs are so afraid of the accusation of being liberal, although it's only the liberals and progressives that are supporting them and tuning into their programs. When these programs have a liberal or progressive guest, somebody who provides a more critical perspective on issues like Israel and Palestine, they seem to challenge those guests far more aggressively than they would otherwise. On this issue, they put on some Palestinian academic and some Israeli academic or, or a couple of retired U.S. ambassadors to the Middle East, and they try to calibrate it so it's very cautiously balanced and, and uh, very seldom do they get points of view that go beyond the sort of perceived, received wisdom. This audience member interrupted the speaker to emphasize that her question was whether he had been successful in getting through those obstacles, perhaps to get on the program Fresh Air with Terry Gross. Even on Gross's program, she recently had a guest from the New York Times, a person who had lived in Jerusalem, and the way the interview proceeded, this guest would make a statement like, the Israelis invaded Lebanon, and they were welcomed with candy and flowers, but then the tables were turned. But this one-sided commentary proceeds without providing any history. Well, I've, I've, had, I've had a little success, and there are other people working on the media, but I think it has to be stepped up to a high level. There have to be people that press, say, um, here, KOPB, is it? Um, yeah, uh, well, there, there are two. Is there? There's, yeah, there's Oregon TV. Public Broadcasting. Yeah, that's is that, one. Is that radio? I think yeah, and, and press them to to have local programming on the issue, and also to ask All Things Considered and Morning Edition and so forth, to have uh, you know points of view on that 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 usually aren't on. They don't have to. They can interview me, but there are 50 other people they could interview, but they have to hear from from more and more people nationally and locally. So if you don't like what Jim Lehrer's program does, pick up the phone and ask me what their direct dial is or, or, or call and find out from your local P PBS station here. So they begin to hear from people. Because if they only hear from the Israel lobby, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I went around the country <coughs> since the 70s and over and over again journalists here and elsewhere would say, Ned, you're the first person to come in either ever or for several years to talk about Palestinian human rights. We've heard from umpteen different uh, pro-Israeli groups. And where are the Arab Americans here in Seattle? Where are the Jews that think like you in San Francisco? Where are the Presbyterians and the Episcopalians and the Lutherans here in Denver? And I'd say, well, they're here. And that night I'd go out and have dinner with them and they'd complain to me that the press was biased. And I'd say, well, no wonder. They never hear from you people. So, you know, the Oregonian has to hear not from the same three or four very active people here, but from 6, 10, 15, 30 people. Not berating them, but, but you know, trying to get them new information and, and criticizing them constructively. Uh, and you had a question? The next member of the audience asked if there was any value in having a sense of why the United States government persists in supporting Israel. On what grounds does the United States justify having the kind of presence that it has in the Middle East? in particular when confronting the media coverage of these issues. 
we've been talking about this as a global issue, and it is a global issue. But, this member of the audience wondered, what are the other strings that are attached to this? This member of the audience said that she does not see Israel as a kind of puppet of the United States. And she wondered about the need to better understand why the United States continues to provide support to Israel in spite of the many reasons, which seem overwhelming, to see this aid as counterproductive to U.S. interests. What accounts for this? What are the other factors that account for the continuing U.S. support for Israel? No, I... I, I well, if you go to a journalist and you say... If you go to a journalist or a member of Congress... Well, you know, yeah, well, there's this is different dialogue. You, if, I mean, you, I think basically we want to say that the, our, our support of Israel is counterproductive in terms of U.S. relations with the Arab and Muslim worlds and is, is making the, uh, you know, more hostility to the U.S., which can feed into more terrorism against Americans, that the money we're giving to Israel needs to be spent in this country or in the third world where people really need it. Uh, that the diplomatic and political military support we give Israel and financial support is helping the Israelis oppress Palestinians and, and it's giving everyone the idea that the U.S. has a double standard when it comes to human rights. Why should the Iraqis abide by U.N. resolutions but not the U.S.? It's helping the Israelis stumble from war to war and destroying the Israeli economy. Everybody loses. Now, you can get into discussion, are we doing this because the Israel lobby is forcing us to, or because the military-industrial complex wants to sell weapons, or because Israel is a surrogate policeman the way the Shah was, but then when he went down the tubes, we put more, you know, behind Israel. But once you start speculating like that, you know, uh, you're likely to, to alienate the journalist or the, or the member of Congress because they won't agree with you, or they might not agree with you. And in the end, it's beside the point. The Oregonian should be saying that Sharon has to abide by international law, and the U.S. has to insist on that. And why, you know, Bush isn't saying that, who knows? But as my wife would say, we see what he does, and what he does is bad. But it seems that we bad policy. Do the same thing over and over again. Our, our government. How many years? Our go yeah. Well, that's because we've never built up a counterpressure. Right. Why were the politicians all lackeys of the tobacco lobby? Because there was never a counterpressure. Um, and if, you know, you, you've got Congress, you've got a lot of members of Congress that just do whatever the Israel lobby wants, and you've got other members of Congress that are sort of racist. They look at the Israelis as, as sort of um, um, Europeans uh, living out in the Middle East, and the Arabs as, as dirty Muslims and third world people, and they, and they don't like us, and, and we shouldn't like them, and so on. So you've got a variety of reasons. Um, um, you know, somebody told me here that um, somebody in one of these congressional offices had very sort of racist views towards uh, towards Palestinians, and but you can't go in and start calling these people racists. You just have to s work around that. Uh, I looked at my notes and realized that my history lesson totally skipped over the Oslo Accords, which were a real problem because there was nothing in there to say settlements had to stop. You know, not to speak of being removed. So the Oslo Accords, the Israelis drove truck through all the loopholes, and Arafat was taken to the cleaners. And then there's Camp David, where Barack pretty much said, well, you know, you take, we'll keep 78%, which we have. Now we'll let's discuss dividing up the 22% that's left for you Palestinians. And he didn't give the Palestinians much of anything. And if anybody should have been chastised, it was Barack, not Arafat. So much for Oslo and, and uh, Camp David. Yeah. The next member of the audience commented on the issue of suicide bombers. Recalling the famous scene from the film The Battle for Algiers, this member of the audience suggested that if the Palestinians were to offer to stop suicide bombings in exchange for getting tanks and helicopters and jet fighters, the Israelis would not likely go for that. He said he did not expect the new administration in the White House would change any of these policies and that a key part of the problem was Zionism. He also said that he didn't believe that the policies were the result of any great love or support for Jews, and that many of the people who support the U.S. policies are anti-Semites. It's very much the same set of interests that drove U.S. policy in Iraq. It's all about oil, the vast energy resources of the region, and it's all about imperialism. They're the same reasons that Britain is over there as well. It's all about protecting their own interests, 
the interests that formulate and drive the foreign policies of these powerful countries. This member of the audience said that he believed the way forward was one country, one secular state, where Arabs and Jews can live together. Yeah, well, that, that may be the, the future because, because it's, it's harder and harder to envision a viable Palestinian state. And uh, you know, I was sort of a binationalist 40 years ago, and, uh, um, you know, and that may be the best type of, 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 of ultimate and, and, and possible arrangement. Um, and I agree with you, one can't get overly moralistic about, about uh, suicide bombs. When you look at the American people who dropped Hirosh bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the Japanese weren't occupying us at that point. They were on their knees, so to speak. They had not forced uh, millions of Americans into Canada and Mexico, and there weren't uh, millions of Japanese settlers here, and so on. So, so the Palestinian situation is desperate. But, the, but despite that, you know, any Palestinian who's thoughtful about it, like Hanan Ashrari, and I think Arafat himself, will say, A, the suicide bombings are despicable, and B, they're giving the Zionists uh, and the State of Israel the wherewithal to discredit our aspirations and to make it easier to, to sort of frighten the Israeli people into letting Sharon do whatever he wants to uh, in the name of security. So uh, the, the suicide bombing should be opposed on the moral level and on the question of, of, of practicality, if you will. And what you have is that Hamas would like to undercut moderate Palestinians and Sharon likes to undercut moderate Palestinians and destroy the moderates in Israel and they feed each other. Sharon and Hamas, so that it polarizes both peoples and undercuts any, any moderation and makes it harder if the U.S. cared, which it doesn't seem to, to bring the parties together. But I'd like to draw the analogy with South Africa. If the international community had enforced the apartheid government to recognize the rights of, of the weaker party, the, the black South Africans, it'd still be apartheid. Mm -hmm. So you can't just say which some Americans say is, we'll let the Israelis and Palestinians negotiate and solve their own problems. A, Sharon doesn't want to negotiate because he doesn't want to compromise. And B, they can negotiate for 50 years while the settlements continue to increase and there will be no Palestinians left to be represented by the negotiators. So when a stronger party is oppressing a weaker party, you have to have pressure on the stronger party to drop the might makes right approach and uh, to go for a settlement which, which incorporates right and is based on law and, and human rights. That's what we have to ask of the U.S. government, to press the Israelis to recognize Palestinian rights, exactly what happened very belatedly, because we were supporting the apartheid government. The U.S. helped, I think, jail Mandela. Most Americans don't know that. Uh, but eventually we got around to pressing the uh, leadership in South Africa to, uh, to, 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 to give far more than we're asking the Israelis to do. They didn't give, you know, they didn't have a two-state settlement in South Africa. They turned things upside down. So the blacks in a single state, mind you, are now overwhelmingly the majority when it comes to, you know, one person, one vote. All that we're asking the Israelis to do is to give the Palestinians 22% of this, this area. That's nothing compared to what de Klerk and the, and the South African, Af African whites were asked. Um, yeah. The next member of the audience observed that what really turned around the struggle in South Africa was the use of boycotts. It was the use of boycotts, pressure on corporations doing business in South Africa, increasing the visibility of the links between these corporations and the apartheid regime that began to influence the South African government. Do you have some companies here based in, in, in Oregon that... that, uh, <laughs> but, that the audience member followed up by suggesting that there is a need to pressure legislators as well, but asked the speaker if he had any suggestions or ideas about how to structure boycotts in this case, strategies for a boycott campaign. Well, there, there are boycotts and pressures on Calip, uh, Caterpillar that, that sells the Israelis these huge uh, bulldozers. Um, there were pressures on McDonald's, on Starbucks, uh, Burger King, you know, with lesser or greater success. But these are often very limited, like, you know, don't have your Burger King outlets in the West Bank, because that's occupied territory. Well, I think the Israelis in the West Bank, the settlers, and Burger King can survive 
without a, a couple of Burger King outlets in the West Bank. And I think this is, again, dealing with, with little symptoms. And uh, you have to get to the, the core of the matter, which is the massive support U.S. government on our behalf and our name is giving to the state of Israel. And if in the process you want to boycott Burger King, that's good. It's good for your health. <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, yeah. The next member of the audience commented that one of the most monstrous aspects of the conflict between the Palestinians and the Israelis is that since Eisenhower's administration, the weapons supplied by the U.S. to the state of Israel, the tanks, the helicopters, the jet bombers, guns and ammunitions, have been used against Palestinian civilians. Eisenhower's administration had effective rules that prevented these weapons from being used against Palestinian civilians. Since Eisenhower, every subsequent U.S. administration has allowed the Israelis to use U.S.-supplied weapons against the Palestinians. This ought to be an issue not just in every presidential campaign, but in every conversation about this conflict, about the state of Israel. Why do the Palestinians have suicide bombers? The reason is that those are the only weapons that they have to resist the occupation. Yeah. Right. I think there's, there's legislation that really, really should prevent cluster bombs you know, from being sold to the Israelis because they've used them uh, against civilian targets. Um, and, of course, helicopters and so forth. I think Amnesty International called for secession of selling these attack helicopters to, to Israel. Uh, again, I mean, that's important to raise, um, but it's got to be in the context of we need to end the occupation, because if you end the occupation, then, uh, then this isn't going to happen. Because in the end, the Israelis can make their own helicopters. They're pretty advanced uh, uh, technologically. In fact, they have some people in their uh, high-tech industry, in their arms industry, that say, we want to develop our own weapons and not be dependent on American weapons and so forth. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think one needs to, to say this to... Um, for instance, in the leaflet that you pass out when members of Congress from the state go around speaking. Why are we allowing uh, U.S. weapons to be used to kill civilians? Sure, I would throw that right in. Yeah, please. The next question asked the speaker to talk about the amount of private Jewish money that is being sent to Israel and how that affects U.S. policy. Well, there's, there's a lot, but, you know, 30 years ago old fellow like me, you remember the days where the money going from the Jewish community dwarfed it, or the pro-Israeli community, dwarfed it U.S. government money. It's the other way around now. The, the, the American Jewish community, the groups that support Israel, give a fraction of what the U.S. taxpayer gives. So there may be some supporter of Israel here who sends $100 over there, and he picks your pocket for 50 and everybody else's pocket here, and in the end, you know, far more is going. And then, then the fundamentalists. There, there are fundamentalist churches, as, as Dick probably knows, and, and others here, uh, who are giving money directly to settlements. Um, you know, this is all God's plan. And they may be giving more money to the settlements, knowingly, than uh, uh, private American Jewish groups who are more apt to give... Um, I mean, you can now give tax-exempt money to uh, help members of the Israeli Defense Forces in, in, in hospitals and recreation centers, you know. I don't think you can do that for American uh, soldiers. Uh, you see these ads in the Jerusalem Post and, and American Jewish newspapers. So, and these things shouldn't be tax exempt. But I suspect it's peanuts compared to what the, what the U.S. government is giving to, to Israel. All of these things combined. Uh, let me see if somebody uh, back there the next member of the audience described one justification of Israeli government policies. She said that her Jewish friends had said that, even though it seems that there are human rights abuses by the Israeli security forces and violations of international human rights law, the reason that Israel has to do these things is that this is a very atypical war and that the enemy that Israel is fighting are the civilians. And that is why you see the heavy-handed tactics by the Israeli military. This member of the audience asked the speaker to comment on that justification for Israeli policies. She went on to comment on the Israeli government's use of terrorism as the trump card. The Israeli government insists that they will not talk, will not negotiate, until the terrorism, the bombings and suicide attacks come to a stop. 
and yet Arafat is powerless to stop these attacks. Yeah, exactly. So, but people, you know, we talk with the Vietnamese while the fighting went on. In most conflicts, talks go on and the fighting goes on. The idea of the talks is to end the, the violence. So there's no excuse for not talking. Second of all, Isra Israeli violence is, is, is much more lethal, kills far more people, and it's done... I mean, there are now over 500 Israeli, maybe up to 1,000 Israeli reservists who refuse to serve in the occupied territories. And they say there are two wars. There's a war against terrorism, you know, to secure the Israeli people, and there's a war for the settlements, for their expansion. And we don't want to serve in that war because, A, it's, it's, it's uh, very oppressive of the Palestinians. They say we do not want to serve in order to, to expel, dominate, starve, and humiliate the Palestinians. And second, while we're busy guarding the settlements and beating up on the Palestinians, uh, more violent, and it's easier for Palestinians to go and bomb a bus in Jerusalem because we're not guarding the Israelis behind the Green Line. We're busy guarding the settlers. So our service is A, an injustice to the Palestinians, and B, it doesn't help you know, the, the, the war to protect Israelis from violence. So uh, we need to say to the American Jewish community and to journalists and, and, and members of Congress, look at what the Israelis are, are saying. They're saying that this is what Sharon is up to and that the U.S. should not be supporting it. Um, sure, there are, there are civ I mean, you don't try to shoot someone from Hamas in a crowded civilian area. I mean, what if, what if the 9-11 people, I mean, they did attack the Pentagon, which is a military target. You know, what if there had been offices of the CIA in the Trade Towers? Probably were, or something like that. So, you know, we got rid of that military office or something, and there was some collateral damage. So, and that's why uh, pilots in Israel, some of them very highly uh, trained and, and, um, and um, you know, highly revered, uh, a bunch of them refuse now to drop any bombs on civilian areas. And what you do is the Israelis put settlers into Gaza, which is illegal. They take land away from Palestinians, which is illegal. And then when Palestinians try to protect themselves and attack a settlement, then you have to kill more Palestinians. You have to destroy all their orchards and homes you know, within uh, half a mile of the settlements. And the settlements expand, and then you have to destroy more, and where is this going to end? There was a cartoon once showing uh, Israeli settlement 2066 being put in somewhere around Tibet. And there was this, <laughs> there was this chasm, and there was some Tibetan with a, with a shotgun trying to shoot a, a rock across the, the, uh, the gap there at the settlement 2036 or something, and this was back at Golden Meir, someone was prime minister, saying, well, we've got to protect these settlements from those terrorists over there. So, which was Oliphant or someone who, and the cartoonists, they cut to the, to the quick and the core, and, and uh, they're usually pretty good on this issue, many of them. So, um, I, I think you just have to say to people, the Israelis have a fence around Gaza. There's maybe, there was this one recent incident where some people got out of Gaza and committed a, 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 you know, a bombing attack, but primarily, the Israelis are there to protect these settlers. All they have to do is take the settlers out. And they shouldn't have a problem with anyone in Gaza, and no one in Gaza will have a problem, you know, at that point with Israeli settlers who, who won't be there anymore. You know, yeah. want to take one more question? How about I, I start okay. circulating this while you're answering the question, <laughs> okay? okay? Yeah. Um, baskets, which you um, pass along if you'd like to contribute to Ned's work. You can s yeah. obviously see he's uh, giving us some great um, <laughs> motivations, ideas. Yeah. Also, we saw lots of hands go up. Uh, willingness to maybe help on this issue. Here's a sign-up sheet if you'd like to be contacted so that we can um, use your energies. Mm -hmm. uh, there will also be people at the door that have the sign-up sheets. How do we make out checks? Oh, checks. Oh. Um, checks to search are made out to search. S-E-A-R-C-H. To the organization yeah, that yeah, Ned's yeah. the director. And if you're just putting in a $10 or 50 or $200 or $6 bill, <laughs> Put your name and address down so we can be in touch with you and if you want and, and you know, thank you and, and put you on our mailing list. And certainly get on the mailing list that Jennifer's circulating because the local groups are, are really geared up and need your, your involvement. The other thing is I forgot to ask how you found out about tonight. Uh -huh. um, how many of you found out through AUPHR's listserv alert? 
Great. <laughs> How many of you found out through Sabeel's alert? Great. Mm. How many found out through Jews for Global Justice? Great. Mm. How many through the Palestine Arab American Association? Okay. How about um, the Vancouver for Peace? Okay. Anyone else uh, yeah. find out through a listserv? Well, just in our uh, church bulletin. Church our, our bulletin. Oh. Out, so. Excellent. Which okay. Church? Which, Which church? church? This one? Westminster. Oh, oh, good, good. Okay, yes? Hmm? Portland Peaceful Response Coalition. Excellent, thank you. Oh, okay. good. And the Argonian. Yeah. The Argonian. Oh. Yes, okay. We could, uh, <laughs> and, uh, yes? And some Brits said eight. Oh, that's right. Brits said eight. Good. Um, also? And Salem Solidarity with Palestinians. Oh, great, great. You that's came up from Salem? So Salem, Palestine. Oh, um, I love that. Salem, um, Palestine so Solidarity so Group. Indie Media. Indie yeah. Media, wonderful. Yeah. How about okay. back there? How did you find out? How you found out? About tonight. Brit said it. And uh, how about yourself, the, the non-citizen? Oh, oh yeah. yes. Oh, the media. Sorry. The um, media. Okay. 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 Oh, okay, good, Great. good, good. Okay. And the gentleman sitting next to you also? Yeah. No together, okay. <laughs> That's why I suspected, yeah. Now, I also want to call your attention, if you don't know about AUPHR's webpage, it's excellent, and there's a calendar posted on the left. If you click on it, it'll show you a month at a shot or two. And then you'll find out about upcoming different um, speakers, events, etc. And we have, uh, some of you know, uh, I've contacted um, various um, organizations that are active on this issue. So some of you um, have volunteered to be representatives to meet with Ned after this. We are going to be meeting at 8.30 in Room B. So if you were contacted by me about that, um, that's where you will meet at, at 8.30. So okay. you have probably time for and, one more okay. question. And, and we, we do have a website, not as sophisticated as a lot of others, but it's www.searchforjustice, all run together, and for spelled out F-O-R, dot org. And the home page shows an uh, American Jewish woman, Ellen Siegel, and a Palestinian woman, got a, uh, I think, Car Carney, I've forgotten her, her name. They both have signs, and one sign says, I'm a Palestinian, I was born in Jerusalem, but I cannot return home. And the other one says, I'm an American Jew, I was born in the U.S., but I can, quote, return, unquote, you know, to, to Israel. They took, they had this picture taken in 1973 in front of the Israeli embassy in Britain. 25 years later, they returned to the exact spot, 1998, was it, I think, and had the exact same picture taken. And I think it's the second picture where the hair is graying, which is on our homepage. And that really tells it all, that the law of return is used to bring Jews from Portland or anywhere else. Anyone here who wants to convert to Judaism can then rush off. And the right of return is denied to indigenous population despite uh, international law and repeated UN resolutions. Um, you know, the next member of the audience observed that the speaker had emphasized that the main problem we face is U.S. government support for Israel. Apart from the role of the media and apart from Congress, what is your understanding of the reasons for Bush's support for Israel? Well, it, it's, I think it's a, it's a, it's a mixed, multi-causal reason, and it varies from member of Congress to member of Congress and newspaper to newspaper and president to president. I mean... I think Kennedy had his reasons, and Clinton had his reasons, and pressures, and, and Bush, and so forth. I don't think you know, Bush is exactly doing things for the same reasons that Clinton did, and so on. So I'm not a psychoanalyst. And unless these people leave their memoirs, you know, and, and, and we're not really privy to them, and, and, or, or they're not necessarily going to... psychology of, the, of, 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 our, of our No, I'm not sure why Bush is supporting Sharon. I think for various reasons. One because he wants to support and he's under pressure from the Christian right and the Israel lobby, Christians and Jews. Uh, two, because he thinks this is a way to contain uh, Islamic radicalism and, uh, and uh, hostility to the U.S. Three, it's a way to help c control oil resources. Four, um, maybe his own personal belief in God comes into this and his understanding of the end, end of days and Armageddon and, and all of that. I don't know whether he, I mean, he is a member of the United Methodist Church, which certainly isn't where Jerry Falwell is. But where Bush is, I don't know where he is. 
and maybe Laura doesn't know where he is. <laughs> so all we can see is what the man does. We're back to my wife's wisdom. We know what he does, and that's wrong, and that's got to be changed, and the reasons are all speculative. But we know that, that in, in one, you know, from one member of Congress to another, the reasons may be largely this and a little bit of that, and another member of Congress, it's a reverse. Some of them are thinking of the cold, used to think in terms of the Cold War, Israel is a surrogate, like, like the Shah of Iran and the Saudis. We control the Middle East through our friends and the Turks. Others were maybe not thinking in those terms. They were thinking, we need votes from uh, the American Jewish community. And so again, yeah, yeah. The next member of the audience described a meeting with Oregon Congressman David Wu. One of the congressman's aides said that Congressman Wu was sympathetic to Israel because he felt that Israel was like Taiwan and that the Palestinians were like China. <laughs> well, I can't... I can't. But that does, yeah, I don't, I don't doubt that. But that doesn't mean that really that's what Wu thinks. There's what they say and what they really think. And, and the next member of the audience observed that the typical member of the U.S. Congress doesn't have an overall vision for anything. Right. If you compare them to members of the French Parliament or the German Bundestag or the British Parliament, they're pretty, pretty ignorant bunch. And, uh, um, yeah. Another member of the audience argued that these members of Congress certainly know what could hurt them, and they believe that if they show any lack of support for Israel, their re-election chances will be hurt. Yeah, but that's why we need to show them that they can say two and two makes four, exactly. because they don't know we're here. The next member of the audience recounted a story of Harry Truman, who when asked about his support for Israel and the impact on his Arab constituents, replied, that he had no Arab constituents. There were, there were none, right, right. But now Bush knows that if he loses the support of the Muslim community, which he's losing, he's going to have even more trouble winning Michigan. I mean, he lost Michigan last time, and he's going to have no chance to get it back. And it may hurt him in, in Florida and other places. Uh, um, and, and then you get a lot of members of Congress that just have racist attitudes towards Muslims and, 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 and Arabs and people in the third world. And then there's some benighted ones, or at least there used to be, who thought that Israel was sort of David fighting Goliath. You know, there were all these Arab countries, and if we don't support Israel, we'll get pushed into the sea. Now, if you really still believe that, you're really sort of um, living in a, in a time warp. Uh, let me see if there's someone, and I want to get to you, that hasn't asked a question yet. I think these two women, you and Bob. The next comment from the audience was that there may also be some residual sympathy for the Jewish community from the Second World War. For the, sure. For the Guilt. Community, I'm sure there are a lot of Lutherans that are still wrestling with the fact that Luther was a raving anti-Semite, yes. and the Lutheran Church has just gotten around <laughs> to apologizing, especially if they're German Lutherans as opposed to Scandinavian <laughs> Lutherans. They have to deal with that, and they have to deal with the fact that their rabbinical friends, uh, you know, or Jewish friends, may wonder about them. Are they anti? Or, are you anti-Semitic if you're criticizing Israel? You know. This member of the audience also commented on the dwindling Christian population in Palestine. Most of the Christians in the region are Palestinian. Those that could get out have gotten out. Recently, Franciscans have been having trouble getting visas. Yeah, they're not getting visas. Are not getting visas. So then, are there Franciscans here? They ought to be out in the streets protesting, and other Catholics. This member of the audience commented that she thought Christians in the U.S. would be concerned about this but it seems not to have gotten any significant attention. Well, you can ask yourself, why was it that an American Jew had to come along to get a thousand and one hundred Christian leaders, one rabbi thrown in, to call for a cutoff of, of USA to Israel? Huh? Why, why did I have to chase after bishops? It needs to come from the, from the Christian community and you need to press your leadership. I can't sit in, in, in the Lutheran bishop or the Episcopal bishop's office if they refuse to say anything, but the Lutherans, Episcopalians in Portland and Seattle can do that. Or at least, you know, try to, to press them in a more polite fashion to, to say something because, you know, Jews in this country are concerned about the Jewish community in existence over there. Why shouldn't Christians be uh, equally concerned, especially since it's a population that's dwindling so quickly? Um, yeah. Yeah, of course. The next member of the audience asked the speaker if he thought divestment was a strategy worth pursuing. Uh, it sort of died down. I, I, I think it's worth 
do trying. But I mean, I wouldn't spend a huge amount of time if I were a professor at Harvard trying to get Harvard to, to divest from some company somewhere. It's, they're never going to get that far, but it's, it can be used as a, as a consciousness raiser, as a way to, to expose what Israel's doing. But meanwhile, that professor at Harvard ought to be trying to talk to people in Congress. One member of the audience explained that a divestment campaign doesn't have to target companies, but that such a campaign could target investment in Israeli bonds. Oh yeah, I mean there are states that invest in Israeli bonds, like Ohio. And they take the money, what the pensions of, 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 of civil servants, teachers and so on, public employees, and they invest them in Israeli bonds, not in the state of Ohio. It seems to me that's a scandal. And what is the state of Oregon doing uh, with its, where is it investing money? Do you even know whether it's investing in Israeli bonds? The next member of the audience commented that the divestment campaign against apartheid had been primarily a mobilizing tool and in fact did not bring significant pressure on companies. The pressure on those companies came from two directions. First, the South African economy started going into serious decline because of the internal resistance. It's possible that a similar thing may be happening in Israel today. The difference is that the U.S. was not spending $4 billion a year to support South Africa. The second factor was the strategy by divestment campaigners to persuade city governments to not buy from companies that had links to the apartheid regime in South Africa, so that there was a serious decline in business revenues, not a decline in investors, but a decline in sales. The lesson seems to be that if you want to influence the policies of the Caterpillar Corporation, we ought to work to get the city of Portland to refuse to purchase any equipment from that company rather than work on shareholder resolutions or retirement funds to divest from Caterpillar shares. Yeah, and also the city of Portland doesn't, doesn't buy goods from Israel or trade with Israel or something. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, that's a good point. And um, so somebody needs to research all that for Portland. The next question from the audience was from a member of Jews for Global Justice. He said that the issue of money was where Jews for Global Justice parted ways with many other Jewish peace groups. Like Jewish Voice for Peace, Jews for Global Justice supports the cutoff of U.S. military aid to Israel until there is an end to the occupation. For many Jewish groups that are opposed to the occupation, the idea of cutting off money raises fears that such a move would threaten the existence of Israel, fears that the Jews would be driven into the sea, and these fears persist in spite of the fact that Israel has nuclear weapons and that its military is one of the most powerful in the world and certainly is overwhelmingly dominant in the Middle East. This member of the audience said that for him it was crucial that we talk about the money, that we advocate a cutoff of this financial support. This is essentially the amount of money that Israel needs to keep this occupation going, to maintain and expand the settlements and the infrastructure the system of bypass roads and highways that connect the settlements to one another and to Israel, to the country that exists inside the Green Line, inside the pre-1967 borders. This is the money that pays for the settlements, that bought the bulldozer that killed Rachel Corey. It's an important matter of principle, a matter of conscience. Yeah, it'll force, it'll force Israelis to say they can't have their cake needed too. They can't have the occupation and a viable economy. Just as South African whites was probably the business community, Afrikaner and English, that turned against apartheid and said, you know, we want to have a good economy and have all this investment and trade, and we can't have that. Our cake and eat it too and keep apartheid. And they were the ones that probably undercut apartheid. And uh, the people in Israel that are in high tech and so on and, and, you know, are involved with the international economy, those are the people who will be the first to turn against the occupation if they realize that... <laughs> that their businesses and the economy are going down the tubes. Not guilt the works like guilt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I think I probably uh, need to close the meeting, but I'm very grateful. One more question. The next member of the audience asked the speaker whether a particular claim she had heard was truth or propaganda. She said that it had been said many times that the true goal of the Arab nations, not just Palestinians, but the Arab nations, is to wipe the state of Israel off the face of the earth. 
Well, the Arab League decided to accept Israel unanimously, and that was when last, uh, or now it's maybe April of 2002, I think. So even, even Saddam Hussein and, and in Libya, that's trying to get back into the good graces of the West, agree unanimously in, in, in essentially an agreement where Israel would leave the occupied territories and the, the Arab world would not only recognize Israel but, but open up you know, trade relations and, and diplomatic relations. So that's something that really, if people say that, one needs to respond. When people write letters that say the Palestinian schools teach Palestinian kids to hate Jews and that's why there are suicide bombings, we need to be able to respond and say, hey, this is just not the case that studies by Israeli and American social scientists have shown that the Palestinian schools are, are just as um, you know, good as the Israeli schools when it comes to being reasonable about the other side. And when Jeff Jacoby writes a column in the, in the Oregonian, and he's based with the Boston Globe, my home paper, uh, and he makes these outrageous statements. You really need to go to the Oregonian, the, the public, uh, you know, the ombudsman, the public whatever he is, editor. editor, and to the opinion page editor and say, you've got to ask Jeff Jacoby, where does he get this information? And if he gets it from the Israeli embassy, that's not good enough. Does he have any independent verification of all these outrageous claims he makes? And he makes this claim, but Israeli and American social scientists say exactly the opposite. And so in the end, papers should not be running Jacoby. You know, I can't get away with that. If I say there are 500 uh, Israeli, re Israeli reservists who refuse to serve, and Zionist groups, you know, ask the, 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 uh, the Oregonian, where does Hanauer get this outrageous claim? I can, you know, say, here's a website of these people. They exist. Uh, the Boston Globe even ran an editorial saying they're heroes, uh, these 500 people, which was to the Globe's credit. Um, so you've got to really press the journalists to do a better job, press members of Congress to represent you and not the Israelis <laughs> or the Israeli government, and organize uh, at the grassroots. So thank you very much. You've been listening to Ned Hanauer, founder and director of Search for Justice and Equality in Palestine, Israel. Search, which has been active since its founding in 1972, seeks to improve American media coverage of the Arab-Israeli conflict by disseminating information about the issue and by urging journalists to cover the conflict accurately and to support a just peace in editorials. To find out more about Search and its work, please visit their website at www.searchforjustice.org. Ned Hanauer spoke in Portland, Oregon on April 13, 2004. Two years after giving this presentation, on August 10, 2006, Ned Hanauer, a lifelong peace and human rights activist, passed away after a short illness. He was 68 years old. What follows is the memorial essay about Ned Hanauer posted at the search website. Ned Hanauer dedicated his life to peace and human rights issues and worked in particular for reconciliation between Palestinians and Israelis. Realizing that this work required full-time attention as well as an organizational base, he left teaching in 1971 and in 1972 started the organization Search for Justice and Equality in Palestine, Israel. The mission of this organization was to inform members of Congress, journalists, and other opinion makers about aspects of the conflict between the Palestinians and Israeli Jews that did not always get a hearing in the political establishment and the media. In the early years of its existence, before the Internet, the organization published a newsletter, the Palestine-Israel Bulletin. In cooperation with Dr. Israel Shahak, the chairman of the Israeli League for Human Rights and Civil Rights, the bulletin brought many articles from the Israeli press that were critical of Israeli policies to journalists, members of Congress, and the general public. The lead article of the first issue published in February of 1978 was entitled Israeli Settlements, Obstacles to Peace. In his writings and in his talks to American audiences, Ned Hanauer frequently drew a parallel between the fate of the Native Americans and that of the Palestinian people. 
Ned Hanauer's op-ed articles and letters to the editor appeared over the years in many newspapers and magazines, such as the New York Times, the Boston Globe, the Chicago Tribune, the Dallas Morning News, the Christian Science Monitor, USA Today, the International Herald Tribune, and Newsweek. Ned Hanauer stands in a long line of Jewish critics of Israeli policies, from a Had Chaim, who believed that one cannot push the native population out of its homeland without resistance, to Martin Buber, who sought reconciliation of Palestinians and Jews, to Rabbi Elmer Berger, Israel Shahak, and many, many others too numerous to mention. His concern about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict dated back some fifty years. As a pacifist, he was committed to bringing about reconciliation between the parties by nonviolent means, something that Search consistently advocated. For the last thirty-four years, Search has carried out its work according to its motto. Search believes that justice for Palestinians and security for Israeli Jews are not mutually exclusive, but interdependent. Edmund Raz Hanauer was born on March 1, 1938, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He earned a Bachelor of Arts in History from Dartmouth College and a Doctorate in Political Science from American University in Washington, D.C. His dissertation with the weighty title An Analysis of Conflicting Jewish Positions Regarding the Nature and Political Role of American Jews with particular emphasis on political Zionism, indicates his abiding preoccupation with the many aspects of this issue. Before forming Search, Ned taught political science at the University of Maryland European Evening Division, a program for the U.S. Armed Forces, and at Babson College in Wellesley, Massachusetts. This program was produced by PDX Justice Media Productions. To find out more about our work, please visit our website at www.pdxjustice.org. You'll find free streaming video and audio programs on a broad range of topics, including economics, globalization, war and peace, human rights, and science. Thanks for tuning in, and thanks for supporting listener-sponsored radio, public access cable television, net neutrality, independent bookstores, and all forms of grassroots, democratic, community media.